We've got a great This Week in Law coming up for you next. Mike Keyes joins me along with Jessica Medersen, our guest of Hanson Reynolds, and also of The Legal Geeks, a blog that considers the HIPAA ramifications of Dr. Strange's pilfering of files, among many other interesting things. We're going to get to a bunch of their posts today, consider who owns the Falcon, consider real-world legal disputes like what's going on in Axinar and how the fair use claim there might uh, fare on summary judgment. We'll talk about Netflix, both what you can download and whether it will be taxed, and lots of legislative developments this week too. All next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill. This Week in Law with Denise Howell, Mike Keyes, and Emery Roan. Episode 368, recorded December 2nd, 2016. Give the falcon to Chewy. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by FreshBooks the super simple cloud accounting software that's giving thousands of freelancers and small businesses the tools to save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash twill. And by Braintree. Looking to set up payments for your business? Braintree gives your app or website a payment solution that accepts just about every payment method with one simple integration. To learn more, visit braintreepayments.com slash twill. Hi folks, and welcome to This Week in Law. I'm Denise Howell. Uh, co-host of the show, along with Mike Keyes, who is here today as well. Hello, Mike. Great to see you. Hello, Denise. Great to see you as always. It's fun being here in the studio. This is one of the few times I've been able to record this week in law from our studio here in Petaluma, uh, festively decorated for the holidays, as you can see if you're watching our video. Uh, great to be here and enjoying the ambiance and welcoming to the show for the first time, Jessica Medersen. Hello, Jessica. Hi there. Nice to be here. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, I know Victor on the board is excited to have you on the show. We <laughs> tend to do shows about technology law here on This Week in Law, but every now and then, and we've got to, uh, let me assure all of our regular listeners that we've got tons of technology law in the rundown for today. Uh, but every now and then we go down the road of the law of universes of fantasy and comic books. And <laughs> Jessica is just the person to have here for that aspect of our fun and frivolity of today. <laughs> she is the co-author of The Legal Geeks, which is just a wonderful blog uh, that does just that, that looks at the comic universes, uh, fantasy universes, and the issues they confront and tries to unpack how the legal issues there would play out under law as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does fabulous job along with her co-author Josh Gilliland. Is that how we say Josh's last name? That is it. Uh, so I encourage you guys to uh, check that out. Uh, longtime listeners of the show will know that we um, have had before the Law and the Multiverse guys on. Do you know them, James Daly and Ryan Davidson? I certainly know of them, and I've read some of their posts, which are awesome. But, you know, I never have actually spoken to them. That does seem odd. We should hook up at some point. Yes, I'm sure you will. At some point, uh, you'll have a mega panel at Comic-Con or something. And you <laughs> need to right. just fess up right here and right now that you and Josh started the Legal Geeks to score yourselves tickets and panel spots at Comic-Con, right? I mean, that's why you do it. <laughs> you know, it has worked out that way very well. Um, but that was not the original intent. But, yeah, I had no idea that it started the Legal Geeks with Josh would lead us to two years so far and three panels at Comic-Con. But awesome. it has been definitely uh, the greatest bonus from doing the podcast and the blog. So I should mention, too, that Jessica is the managing partner of the Madison, Wisconsin office of Hanson Reynolds and a trial lawyer who's um, had all kinds of great trial experience and also has a strong interest and uh, experience with e-discovery. So it's great to have you on the show, Jessica. Thanks. I'm very excited to be here. And I forgot to mention, of course, as I usually do, that Mike is a partner at uh, Dorsey & Whitney in Seattle. How are things going in Seattle these days, Mike? 
Things are going great. I've been on the road quite a bit and uh, participating in this podcast from various points outside of Seattle, but uh, all is going quite well. Good, good. Good to hear. Uh, I know that you've been busy and uh, your creative juices have been flowing. In fact, you are the author of our featured copyright topic for the day. So let's get right to that. Uh, we discussed this uh, lawsuit on the show, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. Um, the lawsuit about, oh, the places you'll boldly go, a, uh, a, a, a Kickstarter project that looks like it's not going to get off the ground. Uh, they were hoping to crowdfund a book that was a mashup of Dr. Seuss and Star Trek, of course. Uh, so unfortunately, though, the uh, copyright police look like that's not going to ha make it happen. We, we discussed that in some length on the show, but we did not discuss it in verse. And Mike did mm -hmm. on his blog, the TMCA.com. So Mike, I, I just need you, I think, to read us some of your favorite passages from your post. <laughs> <laughs> wow, where shall I start? Or maybe the um, whole thing, it's not very long. I, I, could, I could give it a go here. Your, your best me, dramatic oh, okay. reading, you got it, please. You've got it on the screen. Yes. Okay. Let me, let me see what I can do here. All right. So it goes something like this. It's called Dr. Seuss, Susan Seuville, This Holiday Season. You know Green Eggs and Ham and the Cat in the Hat, Horton the Lorax, and others like that. But a new book is coming, although now a bit slow. It's called Oh, the Places You'll Boldly Go. Sure, it sounds like the book already penned by Doc Seuss, but it's not. Oh, it's not. An infringer's on the loose. Or so claims the estate of the author of Grinch. Bring on the lawyers. This case is a cinch. So the lawyers lined up and formed quite a roster, all hands on deck, to take down this imposter. They filed their suit for the Green Eggs writer and sought an injunction to make things a bit brighter. Who is this villain, this dastardly soul? Who dares to infringe, oh, the places you'll go? The main culprit's a company called Comic Mix, and its VP and others are in quite a fix. It is claimed they have copied a work of great fame and created confusion in the market for same. They may ask, what's the problem? Say, what the heck? It's simply a mashup with a touch of Star Trek. We know about fair use and its factors of four. We're sure to prevail at the courthouse door. But fair use is tricky, as the defendants may see. It's not quite as simple as A, B, and C. Who will prevail? Say, who will win? The defendant's chances appear quite dim. An injunction is likely, perhaps damages too, and fees for the lawyers, after all, they had to sue. For what appears to be a very good reason, Dr. Seuss, Susan Seuville, this holiday season. We will keep you all posted. It should be quite a sight. Happy holidays to all, and to all, a good night. Yay! Yay! That is so good. I know. I love it. <laughs> I, I'm just hoping that the, the case makes it to an appellate decision somewhere and some of your verse can be quoted. <laughs> now, that would be fun. Yes. Absolutely. That would be great. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, nothing more really to share on that front. The lawsuit is ongoing. And as Mike uh, expounded in verse. We will keep you posted as to uh, what happens with it. We'll keep an eye on it for you. Uh, we'll have to um, dis, uh, pull Mike out of the 12-step program that we're going to put him into fairly soon here because I don't think he's actually able to stop writing in Susie in verse. <laughs> but, uh, that should be all your briefs from now on. Yes. I'll have to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, somebody's got to try to give Mark Randazza a run for his money, you know, writing a brief in Klingon. In, uh, Klingon so, you know, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just doing my part. Well, uh, that, what a wonderful segue to our next batch of stories to discuss on the show, because we're going to talk about Axanar and a few other entertainment and Hollywood related items. So the case that Mike was alluding to involves CBS and Paramount coming after the folks who would like to make a movie called Axanar, uh, but are being stifled by the lawsuit against them. That lawsuit has been proceeding for a while. There was some hope that it was going to go away. J.J. Abrams made some comments that made it seem like 
uh, perhaps it was not going to be pursued. But what instead happened was um, some fan fiction guidelines, fan film guidelines came out from CBS and Paramount uh, that wouldn't have encompassed Axanar at all. Axanar was far longer and more involved than um, anything the guidelines uh, anticipated. So the lawsuit goes forward. Uh, and now we are procedurally at a stage with it uh, where we might see something happen. Uh, both parties have filed motions for summary judgment. And what that can do uh, is if the court decides to grant either of the motions, uh, it can make the case go away. Um, so we'll have to see what the court decides to do with this. Um, there are a number of arguments being asserted by the parties on summary judgment. Uh, one argument uh, that the Axonar folks are putting forward is, hey, we haven't even made a film yet. You know, how can you be suing us for infringement when all we're doing is raising money and uh, hoping to create this thing? We won't know if it's infringing until after the fact. Um, I'm not uh, quite sure what the court's going to make of that. Uh, then they go on to the fair use issue. And that's really, I think, the meatiest aspect of this dispute uh, with both parties claiming vehemently uh, either the anticipated film uh, will be fair use and some of the things uh, we get a lot of detail on this front from the summary judgment pleadings. Um, one thing that we learn, for example, is that Axanar has 57 characters and 50 of them are original. They don't come from the Star Trek universe at all. They are original creations of the, the would-be film. Um, so things like that will factor into the fair use analysis, as will things like, uh, hmm, are, you're not going to make money off this movie, but you've raised a ton of money and you're paying the actors and the really professional staff that you're hiring and you've renovated a soundstage and you're maybe going to use that for more films. Um, so th there's just a lot in the mix here for the court to try and determine um, and the other thing to bear in mind, too, is that fair use is a really factually intensive kind of inquiry. And as such, that might be something that uh, can't be resolved on summary judgment. Summary judgment uh, lets the court look at the facts that have come out and are established to date. But if they need more facts to be put in at trial, uh, then the court will let the case go to trial. So, Mike, what do you think about this? Well... Um, I, I, as we've talked about before, I think it raises a lot of interesting issues. As you mentioned, the fair use claim is probably the most uh, meatiest of them all. Uh, there's also an issue, though, with respect to substantial similarity. The briefing that's submitted by the defendants, you know, set, uh, on fair use notwithstanding, they say, look, we're not even infringing. What the plaintiff's claims really boil down to is alleged similarities between such things as clothing, shapes, words, colors, and short phrases. And so I think one of the arguments that the defendants are making is you don't even need to get to fair use. We're just not infringing as a matter of law. Uh, but then you do have the whole fair use component here that is a very fact-specific inquiry. The court looks at really four different factors in assessing uh, whether fair use applies. Um, I think it's probably one of those questions of fact that a jury's ultimately going to have to grapple with here. I think there's arguments on both sides, of course, from from the plaintiff's perspective. They're like, this is not a piece of, of, of uh, this is not a fan film. Really, this is looks like a commercial enterprise here. And they've raised a whole bunch of money. They're certainly taking some of the unique original aspects of our expression, and it's not uh, it's not fair use. Of course, the defendants are going to say, look, one of the most important factors, if not the most important factor when it comes to fair use, is whether the work is transformative. Have you taken the original, have you added to it, and done so in a meaningful way to comment on it or criticize it or otherwise create a new work? And as you pointed out, uh, Denise, there's apparently 50 new characters that have been added to the mix here. And some of the ones that have been used by the defendants, I guess, are on the fringes of some of the, the Star Trek films from before. So, you know, there's 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 decent arguments on both sides. I, I guess we'll we'll have to see where this ultimately where this ultimately shakes out. But 
I I know I've actually tried a case in front of Judge Klausner before. He was the judge uh, in the Led Zeppelin case, mm -hmm. so he certainly has a lot of copyright experience. I know from my own experience that if the case doesn't uh, get resolved on summary judgment, and if the if the parties don't settle it, it will go to trial. Judge Klausner is known for never. And I mean never um, kicking out cases and allowing the parties more time to explore settlement. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen here. Yeah, me too. Some really interesting issues. Uh, I haven't looked at the briefing closely enough, Mike, to know if they've raised trademark. But I imagine that there could be some interesting trademark claims asserted too in things like maybe Vulcan ears or uh, various other props and right. logos and things used in the show. Do you know if that's come up? I didn't see it in the briefing that I reviewed, but you're exactly right. Um, hearkening back to our other uh, Dr. Seuss Star Trek mashup case, the claims in that uh, case um, it dealt with copyright, but also there was an unfair competition under the Lanham Act, a, a trademark-related claim that you're creating confusion in the market and people are going to think that this film is somehow associated with or sponsored by or endorsed by uh, the Star Trek folks. So. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there if if that issue is is in the case. It may just not be one that was ripe for summary judgment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you think about all this, Jessica? It's it's kind of in the wheelhouse of the legal geeks involving the realm of Star Trek as it does. Well, it does. I mean, obviously, uh, at the Legal Geeks, we spend a lot of time discussing Star Trek. Um, and certainly, one of the things that started me on the path to the Legal Geeks, I guess, was the fact that a lot of lawyers and judges like it. Mm -hmm. um, one of my early blog posts for the Legal Geeks was on Star Trek judges, or judges who quote Star Trek in their rulings and orders. Um, obviously, <laughs> that falls pretty fairly <laughs> squarely within fair use. Uh, but it is something that, you know, I'm old enough to remember the two live crew case involving Pretty Woman and the copyright lawsuit over that that went up to the Supreme Court. Um, and also, uh, I forget the exact title now, but the Gone with the Wind uh, takeoff. Uh, oh, the wind, the done, wind gone. done gone. gone. On, and, you know, and in both cases, they obviously took very iconic works, but they did fall within the fair use um, parameters, even though they were both for profit. So, you know, normally we think, well, it's fair use as long as it isn't for profit. I think in this case, that does seem, from what I've looked at, the weakest part of their case, that this is clearly a budding studio trying to use this to um, get their business off the ground. But uh, I think it used to be... This is my perception, but I'm not the expert, obviously, that Mike is, but that it used to be that it had to be kind of a not-for-profit kind of endeavor to fall under fair use. And there are no cases that suggest that that does not end it if, it's, um, if it is a for-profit effort. Right, and I think they're sort of skirting that issue, saying, oh, we're, we're not going to profit, but we're certainly not going to make folks work for free. We're paying, yeah. paying for our resources is what we're doing. We're covering our costs, but we're not profiting. Um, so again, I think that's not something that any of us sitting here can really, uh, work out, but I, I think it, it will be given a close look in the fair use analysis, whether that really will fly. Um, there's a piece in our discussion points for the show today that talks, that's pretty harsh, uh, on Axinar specifically and on other, uh, what they consider sort of the expansion of the fair use doctrine uh, this is by author Stephen Carlyle, who thinks that, and I'm going to quote him here, fair use is being manipulated as a from a defense to a Harry Potter style magical incantation uh, that makes all copyright problems go away. Um, so uh, that uh, seems to be something that, that could um, crop up in the minds of a judge uh, possibly even a jury hearing this case, that maybe this is a, a taking the fair use doctrine farther than it should go. Um, but again, this is something we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, if anyone wants to read that article or anything else that we're discussing today, you can uh, go to our Flipboard page. It's at D. Howell. Uh, you can find me there on Flip, Flipboard. And um, uh, we have a D This Week in Law uh, group of stories there that you can contribute to if you'd like. Um, we'll get you the information on that. Actually, if you go to my Twitter page, it's right there uh, pinned at the top. Uh, or you can go to tagpacker.com slash user slash thisweekinlaw. Uh, 
And all of our uh, links for this show and the rest of the shows that we've done are organized there by episode number. This is episode number 368. Uh, Mike, do you think the judges might think that uh, the copy, the fair use defense to copyright is being um, pushed too far, not just in this case, but in other cases? Well, I think we've seen an expansion of fair use over the years. Um, you know, some some have been brought along by uh, the judiciary itself. I think there's been a a renewed focus or emphasis on the transformative nature of the work in question, and that that factor, even though there's four fair use factors that the court should consider in its analysis, that that first one, the purpose and character of the use. Uh, really turns on whether the the second work is transformative. Has it infused new meaning I- into the original work? And so I I think that w- we've seen over the years that being um, in some circuits uh, that being not not necessarily a determinative factor, but very very heavily considered in the analysis. So um, I I agree with it to an extent. I think. Sometimes there is this tendency, as in the article uh, th- that you mentioned, pointed out that you, know, you can't just say something's a fair use. You know, I'm providing this for educational purposes, and and therefore whatever you're doing uh, magically transforms into fair use. Right. I think that's... there is a tendency for people to to think that uh, you know fair use can encompass a whole lot of of infringing content. Uh, or, or conduct just because you say, hey, I'm, I'm doing this for educational purposes or, or otherwise. Right. That's one of the author's pet peeves. He, he has stumbled acro- upon many a YouTube video uh, that is reusing work and putting some sort of disclaimer on that says we are doing this as fair use for educational or commentary or other purposes. <laughs> right. And then when you actually watch the video, there's, there's act- none of that going on. Um, so it's, it's not an incantation, folks. You have to actually be uh, making fair use of the material. Uh, one of the things that comes up in Axonar's, uh, in the Axonar dispute, and, and we had Mark Randazzo on the show, as Mike mentioned, uh, who wrote a brief in favor of uh, an argument in that case that the Klingon language uh, is not something that CBS and Paramount can have the copyright to. Um, so that's another issue that is involved there. And of course, he, he used the Klingon language quite liberally in his brief. There is an actual play that's going to be performed. It's running now in uh, Chicago between December 1st and 18th. If you are in the Chicago area, you're not too far from there, Jessica. <laughs> no, it's, I may have to check this out. It's called a Klingon Christmas Carol. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the first play to be performed entirely in Klingon, a constructed language first appearing in Star Trek. The play is based on the Charles Dickens novella, A Christmas Carol. A Klingon Christmas Carol is the Charles Dickens classic tale of ghosts and redemption adapted to reflect the Klingon values of courage and honor and then translated into Klingon performed with English supertitles. I would certainly be going if I were in the Chicago area. And as far as I know, CBS and Paramount have not come after uh, the producers and uh, folks performing in the Klingon Christmas Carol. But watch that space because they claim to have the copyright in the language. Um, You think you'll go, Jessica? (laughs) (laughs) I may have to try and get down there for that. It's a busy month, but I would love to see that. You know, and I do have to say, too, I hadn't thought about that with the Klingon language before, but um, from where I'm from in northern Minnesota, there are these very famous language camps, Concordia language camps that have been around for a very long time. For a while, there was a Klingon language camp there. I don't know if it's still there, but it was there for at least some period of time. And I guess my question now is, um, was there ever a copyright issue there? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm sure that there would be, you know, I mean, and especially because they're profiting uh, from it. Yeah, but maybe they got a cease and desist letter. Maybe that's why, maybe the camp still isn't around. Yes, it's possible. (laughs) Hey, uh, let's shift to, uh, from the realm of Star Trek to the realm of Netflix, where I believe you can still uh, see just about every, if not every uh, episode of Star Trek that was ever made. Um, Netflix is, uh, as of this week, allowing you to download shows, joining Amazon in letting you do that. It's been a very long time coming uh, in connection with its streaming service. And I bring it up on the show 
uh, today for a couple of reasons, um, and that the first being that uh, the rights issues continue to be sticky for Netflix uh, in making the switch. I'm sure the rights issues have been um, uh, looming large and why they haven't done it up until now. I think a lot of content holders get nervous uh, when you allow uh, folks to put something on their hard drive rather than just stream it, no matter how copy protected it is and no matter what sort of self-destruct code is involved in it. Um, but uh, they, they seem to have uh, gotten a lot of their catalog on there. Um, there's a good coverage on, of this in the Wall Street Journal, which writes, uh, you won't be able to download Fuller House or Gilmore Girls, uh, you know, the Marvel original series Netflix is known for, such as the new Luke Cage. Cage. Also not available, nor is any other Disney content, such as Zootopia, Jungle Book, or all those tween-targeted Disney Channel TV series that parents depend on. You can't download BBC shows like Sherlock and Luther and many comedy specials from outside of Netflix's production business, including stand-up films from Louis C.K. and Hannibal Burris aren't available offline either. Netflix is working with lots of partners globally to get downloading rights for the bulk of the content on our service, said a company spokesperson. This is an ongoing effort. So uh, you get House of Cards though, and uh, probably and like lots Ali of Star Wong Trek. And Master of None. What can Sorry, you get? I saw, I saw on the page there, Ali Wong, Baby Cobra, which is amazing, mm -hmm. and Master of None. And so I'm like, most of the stuff I need for my kids, I won't be able to download, but yes. there's, I think, enough for me to get by. Right. Uh, Mike, any thoughts on this progression to allowing folks to um, download? So, I mean, the primary reason to do this is when you're traveling and you don't have a reliable or fast internet connection. Right. It, I, as someone that uh, travels uh, a fair amount, I love this development. I think it's really cool. And I bet we're going to see more and more of this as, as time marches on. So, bravo. Uh, the Wall Street big, Journal. Big fan of this development. The Wall Street Journal also loves that um, this is a fast download. Uh, the downloads are apparently optimized for smaller mobile devices. So right. um, certainly when I've traveled and tried to download movies uh, from Amazon uh, to watch on the plane or what have you uh, in a remote place without internet access, um, it's been a slow grind. But uh, these apparently they're downloading movies in just a few minutes. So that's uh, a nice sign. Uh, great too for folks who don't live uh, in areas that get really good, fast, consistent internet access. Downloading uh, might work better for them than streaming. Uh, sticking with Netflix for a second, uh, I, it, there's an interesting development going on. Again, close to your neck of the woods, this is actually being litigated, Jessica, uh, with various cities around the country uh, considering or actually moving forward to tax Netflix as a utility or otherwise uh, and other services like Netflix. It seems the logic here is that Netflix and Amazon and other streaming services over the top services are uh, making people cut the cord on their cable television service. So the various fees that cities used to build into uh, your cable bill and extract from the cable company are going away if you're no longer subscribing to those services and the cities are not happy about that. Um, in Chicago, there's actually been a lawsuit uh, filed over Chicago's quote unquote amusement tax. Uh, and they're arguing in that suit that the tax, which, which has been enacted, um, required a vote of all the city council members and that it violates the Federal Internet Tax Freedom Act, which forbids states and cities from imposing discriminatory internet-only taxes. Uh, there, was a pa uh, there are many cities in California, I know, considering this. Uh, Pasadena uh, proposed it and had got a lot of news about it and also a lot of outcry from uh, the citizen citizenry there, and it backed down. Uh, but that doesn't mean that other cities will. Um, good coverage on this from Investopedia, which points out that most entertainment services, whether they're cable or theater chains, are taxed. The pressure by states and cities on streaming providers to cough up tax on their services is a testament to their popularity and the important role that they will play in the future entertainment ecosystem. Uh, what do you think about this, Mike? 
Well, I, you know, I'm certainly not a, a tax expert and certainly am not an expert with respect to the federal Internet Tax Freedom Act. But it seems to me that they've got, uh, you know, the Internet companies have got a point here. Uh, you know, that, look, you're you're use, calling this an, an amusement tax, but you're actually taxing the service that we're providing in this federal statute. Uh, prohibits you from doing so. So, I mean, on the surface, I, I, again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but it seems like, you know, at least superficially, it seems like a pretty sound argument to me. Right. Have you heard anything about the Chicago lawsuit, Jessica? I haven't, um, but I was looking into this a little bit after I saw the topic here, and it is interesting. I agree. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not a tax expert either, and it does seem like there may be a federal law that prohibits this, but it actually reminds me of kind of the beginning of the new economy from the late 90s and the early 2000s when the Amazons of the world started selling lots of things that we otherwise would have gone out and bought in local stores, and states started, you know, basically saying, hey, what about the sales tax? Because these things, originally, there was no sales tax. Tax. And so while I understand there's this currently this federal law, I am sympathetic to the fact that, you know, municipalities and states are looking at a lot of the tax income that they derive from these things that before we had to get based on location. Um, they're now saying, OK, you're now migrating away from all those things, migrating away from cable, you know, migrating away from landlines, whatever it is to um, doing everything online. And we need to have a way to be able to, you know, still generate some taxable revenue from these services that are being used by our local citizens. So um, it seems like maybe right now it may be prohibited, but if I were state or municipalities, I'd be lobbying the federal uh, government, I guess, to maybe make some changes. So a couple of interesting comments from chat. Toad Sloth there says, wouldn't it make more sense for those cities to take back their cable from the monopolies? I don't think anybody wants to get into the cable business right now, the cable television right <laughs> business right now. I, I don't think it's necessarily a growing field, uh, but it is, but it is a good point, uh, maybe for a city. Um, and then Virgil is asking, uh, don't they also um, have taxes imposed uh, simply on your ISP access? And I'm sure that they do, but that doesn't mean they don't also have taxes um, on cable service that are separate and apart from that. Uh, that get cut off and aren't charged if people aren't subscribing to cable. So uh, it's an interesting issue. It's um, the uh, Investopedia article points out too that Netflix isn't the only tech company under pressure to ta pay taxes. Airbnb uh, is also in uh, city government or on city government radar. Uh, Amazon is now paying sales tax in 23 mm -hmm. states uh, and it didn't do that before. So um, an interesting thing to watch as this unfolds and, and in particular, keep an eye on the Chicago lawsuit. Uh, we're going to come back in just a moment uh, to get into uh, the fun of who owns the Millennium Falcon, among other things. <laughs> um, but first, we're going to thank our first sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, and that is FreshBooks. FreshBooks has an all new version of its cloud accounting software. It's been redesigned from the ground up and custom built to transform how freelancers and small business owners deal with their day-to-day -day paperwork. Getting started on FreshBooks is extremely simple, even if you're not a numbers person. I am not a numbers person and I use FreshBooks in my business and thank goodness for it because it actually helps me get my invoices out in a timely easy and mathematically correct manner, which is a really important thing. Yeah. Um, it includes a super intuitive tool that makes it easy to create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. There are no formatting or formulas to contend with. It's just really simple, clean and professional looking invoices that you're able to generate. You can add your own logo and color scheme so that your invoice reflects what your clients are used to seeing coming from you. And when you send out an invoice, FreshBooks can show you if your client has seen it. Very important if they haven't managed to get you paid. Set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster. Their super handy deposit feature allows you to invoice for a payment upfront when you're kicking off a project, your clients will appreciate being able to pay by credit card straight from their invoice. FreshBooks has also revealed other features to keep you organized and streamline the business side of being a freelancer or small business owner. Their redesigned dashboard has been curated to answer the most important question, how's my business doing? You can know at a glance what's owed, overdue, or whether you're in the red. 
The notification center works as your personal assistant telling you what's changed in your business since your last login and what should be dealt with like overdue invoices. FreshBooks also automates late payment email reminders so that you can spend less time chasing clients. You can also take pictures of receipts on your phone using FreshBooks apps. And FreshBooks will also handle your time tracking. So when it comes to time to create an invoice, you'll know what you did and when you did it, and it'll go right onto your invoice for you. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to our audience here at This Week in Law. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash twill, enter This Week in Law in the How Did You Hear About Us section, and that will start your 30-day absolutely free trial. Thank you so much, FreshBooks, for your support of This Week in Law. All right. Uh, let's talk about the Millennium Falcon for a second. I, th you have a number of fascinating posts <laughs> on the Legal Geeks blog. Uh, this one is by Brad Blanchard and answers attempts to answer, at least, that age-old question that has plagued Star Wars fans uh, for years and is ongoing as the Falcon continues to fly in the mo new movies. Who the heck owns the craft <laughs> uh you know the easy answer might be han solo uh guess what he's not around anymore that's right so um and lando calrissian uh has some claim of ownership too um so jessica cut to the chase here uh do you agree with brad's conclusion or uh, do you have a different take on who owns the falcon I do agree. I think Brad did a great job um, with this question, one of the many legal questions that Star Wars raises, uh, but really does come down to ultimately was the gambling uh, occurrence event between Lando and Han, was it a legal or an illegal game? If it was an illegal game, then Lando actually did not have to give up the right to the Millennium Falcon to um, Han. And so it still is rightfully Lando's. And he hopefully is still around. I'm hoping he'll make an appearance in one of the other movies to come. Um, if it was a lawful gambling event at a, like a Las Vegas kind of sanctioned poker game or something, then it belonged to Han. And once he died, uh, probably went to Leia if they never officially divorced. Right, so um, Leia. Oh, it's spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, exactly. For anyone, <laughs> you know, I, I think a year that, later. <laughs> I think that everyone who was going to see the Force Awakens <laughs> has seen it by now. I would hope. <laughs> but yes, we are. We are going to spoil that movie for you right now if you haven't seen That's it. That's right. Um, or we already have. Uh, Leia, though, apparently doesn't have any problem with Ray flying around in the Falcon because. That's where things well, left. And Chewie, of course. And we think that maybe Leia may have a special connection to Ray, but I don't know if that would be considered a spoiler too, but that's just speculation. I think that's, yes, just flat out theory <laughs> at this point, but <laughs> who knows? Stay tuned for the next movie. Uh, Mike, any thoughts? Uh, one, I thought the post was brilliant. I loved it. And two, maybe Ray has some sort of adverse possession claim here. I mean, I know it's maybe uh, not uh, not necessarily thought of as a doctrine that applies in the context of personal property, but who knows? The other thing is, so the son of Leia and Han, I forget his name. Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren or Ben. Or yes, ben. thank you. So did Ben, do we know for sure that Ben is no longer in the picture? I mean, I know there was a lot of destruction uh, at the end there, but we don't know definitively that he's dead, right? That Spoiler is true. Alert. He could still be around. Okay. So maybe he would have a claim too. Is that right? Well, if that is. True, except he murdered his father, and some states ah, um, that ah, does cut off point. your inheritance rights. <laughs> that's that's an excellent point. I hadn't <laughs> hadn't thought about that angle. Okay, but what if he were to inherit it from Leia? If she inherited it from Han, that's he, true. Hopefully, he, Leia is going to last longer than Kylo. We need Leia to run the whole gamut. She's the one who's going to save us all in the end. Absolutely. All right. I uh, wanted to just mention, too, that um, No Man's Sky, uh, folks in the UK had been bringing some false advertising claims uh, related to its release, and those have been rejected uh, that uh, people were not allowed to um, rely on the advertising as something that would certainly uh, appear in the game. Uh, folks took issue uh, with some of the graphics, some of the uh, features that were shown in the advertising. 
and said, hey, you know, you promised us this stuff and, and they weren't delivered. Uh, and uh, what was, what's an interesting twist on this and, and the board that decided this agreed that the procedurally generated nature of the game was important in making um, this decision that uh, folks knowing that the game was going to be created on the fly uh, would convey that, that what they were seeing wouldn't be uh, a necessarily accurate representation of what they would experience because the game is different uh, every time and for everyone who plays it. Um, so I thought this was just interesting to throw in. That's something that Mike might be interested in. Are you, Mike? I am. I haven't had a chance to review it yet, but it's definitely right, uh, right in my wheelhouse. So I'll have to give it a look. Right. For all you No Man's Skies fans or haters out there, uh, now you know that uh, don't don't be thinking you can go after them for what they promised. <laughs> At least in the UK, um, that kind of claim did not fly. Let us uh, move on now to a an examination. I put this under privacy because, of course, when doctors have your medical records in their possession, uh, that is one of the biggest personal privacy uh, concerns that we have uh, as a society. Um, but however, we're going to talk about those issues through the lens of Dr. Strange. Uh, this was another of my favorite posts from the Legal Geeks. And uh, that is uh, whether Dr. Strange uh, it was in violation of HIPAA in a pretty serious way uh, when he um, knowingly used the contents of the file of, is his name Pangborn? The guy who um, uh, was similarly spinally injured and went to Nepal uh, and found the ashram where Dr. Strange ultimately goes and, and uh, uh, begins to heal himself and begins his mystic journey. Um, he, is, uh, he has that information shared with him by an orderly who's helping him with physical therapy. Um, and then he immediately, you know, has no sort of... Um, remorse or compunction at all about taking the guy's medical file, tracking him down and figuring out uh, how he was healed. Uh, under our healthcare privacy laws in the United States, this would be a no-no. Can you want to expand on this a bit for us, Jessica? Yeah, the idea, of course, under HIPAA, which is like our major uh, health care privacy act here in the U.S., you can't knowingly disclose uh, personal medical information about somebody to someone else. And so what happens in Dr. Strange, the way he, after he has his uh, injury that basically ruins his ability to be a surgeon because his hands are no longer usable for surgery, um, there's an orderly who tries to tell him about another patient who had similar problems and was actually able to overcome them. Now, just saying something like that is okay because it's not identifying the specific person or getting into those kind of details. So it's okay for a doctor to tell you, for example, before doing a hand surgery, don't worry, I worked on a similar fracture last week, I treated it the same way and that patient is fine. But if you say like this orderly did, don't worry, Joe Blow over here went through the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to give you, well, first of all, even his name, but then even worse, more details about him um, and his medical condition. That does violate HIPAA. And so the person who's actually violated HIPAA in this situation is not Dr. Strange, but it's actually the orderly who knowingly disclosed that information to Dr. Strange about this uh, Pangborn so that he could, so that Dr. Strange could go track him down. Um, the related question that I would have for this is not whether Dr. Strange, I don't think he violated HIPAA in this situation, but whether just like lawyers have certain ethical obligations as part of being a uh, part of a state bar is whether doctors have similar obligations, whether he might be violating something that'd be required by the state medical board by um, taking this kind of information that he should know was wrongfully given to him and using it. Right. That's one of the things that's pointed out in your colleague's post that um, uh, there are state law torts that would supplement HIPAA here to per, actually, first of all, to permit individuals to sue uh, because generally an individual doesn't have a right of action under HIPAA 
Um, it's the government uh, who would impose the fines and penalties and even up to one year of imprisonment, um, but that the states can um, supplement that as well. So it's, I, it definitely doesn't seem like uh, Dr. Strange, since he's uh, using the information for his own personal gain, uh, would uh, be off the hook entirely, I think, in, in this analysis. Right. Uh, Mike, any thoughts? Boy, n none, none here. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I just quote a, a gem of a quote from the post? Although, as mentioned above, there are circumstances under which personally identifiable healthcare information can be disclosed without authorization. None appear to apply here. As an example, Strange would have a hard time arguing that he took Pangborn's, Pangborn's files for researching the ancient one's healing practices because Strange would have needed board approval before taking the files in the first place. And that seems unlikely when the subject of the research is a long-lived bald woman's magical powers. <laughs> so just good, good stuff. Um, let's see. Let's put our first MCLE passphrase into this episode of This Week in Law. And that is going to be Strange Privacy Call. We'll put another one of these phrases in later on. If you're a person who likes to listen for professional legal or other credit, uh, we put these phrases in in case you are in a juris jurisdiction where uh, people need to verify that you actually watched or listened to the show. And if you need more information about that, head on over to wiki.twit.tv, find our This Week in Law page there. And there's uh, information for lawyers on submitting to uh, get MCLE credit Whoops. for the show. Jessica's puppy. Hello, puppy. Who belongs to Jessica? <laughs> you must have someone at the door, Jessica. All right. Uh, let us move on to some issues of regulation and legislation and policy. Uh, some new, these are privacy related uh, concerns as well. Uh, new legislation on the extent uh, of government surveillance and how it is conducted. Uh, the first item is actually not new legislation at all and that's why it's controversial. It is an administrative change to one of the rules of criminal procedure. Uh, the states and our federal government here in the United States have rules uh, that tell law enforcement how to do their job. And one of those federal rules, Rule 41, uh, was just amended, despite the fact that many in Congress uh, thought that this was a pretty sweeping and substantive expansion that required Congress to actually weigh in and consider and vote rather than simply uh, doing nothing and allowing a, an administrative change to go through. This went into effect yesterday, uh, December 1st, and is uh, now the applicable rule of criminal procedure in the United States. It does a couple of things. It clarifies the law that deals with how judges sign warrants that let authorities uh, access computers by basically hacking into them um, in areas outside a judge's jurisdiction. Uh, it also, and this, in today's day and age, maybe that first part um, makes some sense that a judge, if presented with a warrant by a U.S. attorney um, in one jurisdiction where evidence is being gathered in another jurisdiction, um, can have the judge right there in her own backyard issue a warrant to do the search. Uh, that's not as problematic to me as the second part, uh, which gives federal judges now the authority to issue a warrant to search multiple computers without knowing who is the targeted computer owner. Um, so that seems to me problematic in coming up with probable cause, which is what judges have to know is present before they go ahead and issue a warrant in a, cer in a search warrant in the first place. Um, so we'll have to see um, if there are challenges to this rule. Um, it, you know, I'm sure uh, that creative uh, civil rights activists and others are already thinking about uh, if it is applied broadly and unidentified persons are... Um, 
having their computer searched via warrants issued under this rule, I think we're going to hear about it in the future. Mike, have you looked at this? Uh, I did look at it and I was really surprised uh, by this development. I had not been aware of it until um, I, I was reading the show notes. So what what's particularly striking is, as you mentioned, this, this is a procedural rule. Uh, this is uh, something that was put together by an advisory committee and ultimately approved by the U.S. Supreme Court, not elected officials. There are, of course, judicial officials that, that uh, govern various aspects of the federal judiciary. So this sounds like a fairly significant substantive piece of law that actually comes into play not through the legislative process, but through the judicial process. Uh, and what seems particularly striking about it is what you mentioned, Denise, that under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, in order for a warrant to issue, you've got to have particularized suspicion and you've got to be able to articulate what, what uh, you want to search and what you want to seize. And you need to convince the court that there's a reasonable basis uh, for that request. It seems like this creates a procedure whereby you don't necessarily have to have this particularized suspicion or know the individuals whose computers are going to be searched and hacked. So it seems rather, rather sweeping. I wouldn't I'm not at all surprised to see that the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, is opposing uh, criminal procedure rule 41. And we'll have to see if there's going to be any judicial uh, uh, challenges to it. Right. And I, I think another uh, takeaway for folks watching is how this underscores the importance of the judiciary in our country and the discretion that judges have. And so how important it becomes that we put good, competent, um, thoroughgoing, uh, rationally thinking, logically thinking judges on the bench and not uh, folks who would be inclined to... Um, issue a search warrant without giving it the proper attention that it deserves uh, because they are really uh, the last line here in, in how this rule is applied and how they decide whether probable cause is present or not. So um, when you're being called upon to help decide what judges are uh, going to represent you in your local elections and stuff, bear all that in mind. Uh, Jessica, any thoughts? Just tying on to that, my first thought when I saw this about judges being able to sign warrants outside of their own jurisdiction is it basically did bring to mind kind of the forum shopping idea that, you know, you hear plaintiffs lawyers accused of forum shopping, looking for the judges or the forms that are going to be most sympathetic to their case. Mm -hmm. um, my concern here is that obviously that not that the government would hopefully ever short circuit anything, but that they would kind of start to rely heavily on a few judges that they know may be less inclined to give kind of the strict supervision that's warranted when issuing these warrants. So um, that was my first thought. But I agree with you that the second part about not even having to know um, who's, I guess, the target of these does give a lot of concern about how much supervision the court can actually give to these activities then. Right. And, and back to my point uh, about who actually is sitting on the bench, federal district judges are not people that you get to weigh in about. You, you, at least here in California, we can um, weigh in on uh, our local superior court judges um, who are generally the people who go on to become appellate court judges and Supreme Court judges. But federal judges who are the folks who will be applying this Rule 41, they're appointed by the president of the United States. Um, so, bear, you know, not only is it important um, who gets appointed to the Supreme Court, but every federal judge is appointed by the president. So uh, something to just bear in mind, too. Uh, let's move on. Uh, speaking of the uh, president and president elect, we have um, Apple, Amazon and Google uh, hoping that the president elect they have um weighed in and made a specific request that the president elect uh, pay attention to financial uh, technology security um, to the, their hope and the group that uh, these various companies are involved in is called Finn Financial Innovation Now. Uh, they're asking President-elect Trump to uh, appoint regulators 
and promote policies that would bolster the use of financial technology as it gains popularity and prominence. Uh, and they are calling on President-elect Trump to appoint a Treasury Undersecretary for technology for this purpose. Um, so I bring it up because of the coalition of companies um, going to the president and trying to put this on, president-elect, excuse me, and put this on his radar. And also uh, because I think it's an interesting uh, dichotomy that we're going to see unfolding uh, if we do have this um, emphasis and, and if the administration does respond and, and appoint the undersecretary that's being requested here, uh, paying attention to ensuring the security of financial transactions on the one hand, on the one hand, and then uh, potentially pushing harder to backdoor encryption on the other. Um, so, you know, the, the useful encryption versus the bad encryption, I think, is going to play out. Uh, in the next several months as policy of the new administration takes shape. Do you agree, Mike? I I think that's probably right. This will be a, a very interesting uh, story to follow to see what uh, President-elect Trump does. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts, Jessica? No, pretty much the same. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, in keeping with talking about President-elect Trump and uh, things that various technology-related uh, organizations are doing, the Internet Archive has decided uh, that it didn't like comments that were made during the campaign about closing, quote-unquote, certain areas of the Internet in an effort to prevent terrorists from communicating or recruiting online. So in response... Uh, the Internet Archive is putting a database in Canada, uh, which is probably just good backup practice, I would think. Uh, if you're something like the Internet Archive, you would want various databases in various locations. Do you agree, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I would. I would think so. Yeah. You know, Canada, I suppose, is uh, as good as, uh, you know, any other uh, first world country. So what the heck? Right, exactly. And, and I, you know, I don't know if, if there's a justification. Uh, I think I think that President-elect Trump probably wasn't thinking about the Internet Archive when he talked about <laughs> closing up certain areas of the Internet. But but it's it's a good idea. You know, I mean, if if things do actually um, manage to uh, be curtailed, uh, the Internet Archive is is one of our. Uh, best fallbacks, uh, that and the Library, Library of Congress, which attempts to um, uh, archive things as well. Jessica, any thoughts? I think this is just a good reminder that you can't assume or feel like there's always a guarantee anywhere in this world. So I think something uh, as important um, as the Internet Archive should actually consider backups in a few different locations, both ge geographically different and possibly kind of different somewhat politically to sort of hedge its bets because um yeah there is no guarantee that it won't come under assault and then uh with others in the technology industry having uh different kinds of fears about the incoming administration uh folks uh seem sort of you know shrugging putting their hands up going we don't know what the trump presidency is going to mean for the future of self-driving cars the obama administration has been um very hands-off and um uh supportive uh creating an environment in which innovation in that realm could flourish and there are many who think that with um his in general uh scaling back of regulatory uh requirements and uh wanting um i, I haven't heard this particular um item raised uh, in the last week or so, but I believe it was post-election at least that uh, President-elect Trump mentioned how uh, before a new regulation could be uh, enacted in the U.S., he would like to see or is going to require in some way um, two existing regulations go away. So I think that's, you know, at least telegraphing a pretty um, hostile attitude towards uh, corporate regulation in the country, 
uh, which could be good for self-driving car research and development, correct? But then, um, and this is uh, from the article on this at The Verge, uh, there is a fear that Trump, who constantly shifts positions on issues and is known to have an incredibly short attention span, may not share his predecessor's attitude about the importance of self-driving cars and the federal government's role in ensuring a coherent regulatory system across the country. So, um, again, this is just sort of a space to watch. I don't think anybody is probably able to predict whether um, self-driving cars are going to be more or less prevalent uh, development of them in the U.S. at any rate over the next four years, but it'll be interesting to watch. And, and certainly other countries are going to carry on their research and development. Uh, don't you agree, Mike? Uh, absolutely. I don't view this as an area where we're going to see a whole lot of regulatory movement by the next administration. It wouldn't make sense. And, you know, I'm I'm all in favor of kind of letting this continue to develop. And let's see where the research takes us. And this is such an exciting technology, no doubt, as we've talked about on the show before, you know, in five years, this could be a completely different uh, world with the advent of self-driving cars. So, yes, I, I we shall see. Different, different in in many ways, including perhaps bolder pedestrians. And here's <laughs> here's an area where we may need some regulation. There's this study out of the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, about how uh, pedestrians in a world of self-driving cars, armed with the knowledge that they are programmed to avoid pedestrians who stroll in front of them may just start strolling the streets willy nilly <laughs> and chaos <laughs> may ensue. The, the piece at tree hugger uh, is captioned. Will pedestrians and cyclists bully self-driving cars? Um, and, and it's a legitimate concern. I mean, I encourage folks to read the article. It concludes uh, with um, a, something that I think, rings true to me when push comes to shove and it will the cars will get the roads and the pedestrians will get jaywalking tickets fences bridges and underpasses that's just the way it looks <laughs> but but i do think this this whole notion that you know as we move more to uh, autonomous vehicles on the roads that people will try and game them i think that's just human nature do you agree jessica I do. I, you know, I already see this um, just city by city. There are some cities where kind of the pedestrian right away is very much enforced. And you can see even there that the pedestrians are bolder mm -hmm. um, in striking out across the street. Whereas there are some cities where apparently the pedestrians have little rights. Um, and you can tell the difference even in that behavior. You know, living out in the suburbs myself right now with kids, I like the idea of if they run out into the street, um, no matter how much I yell at them, that I don't need to worry about a car, one of these self-driving cars anyway, hitting them. But I could see it being a problem if pedestrians aren't on their best behavior and hopefully not abusing their new power when it comes to the self-driving cars downtown. Absolutely. And, and you know, assuming that pedestrians do get bolder, I mean, I think there would be an outcry for changes in the law or at least more um, stringent enforcement of jaywalking laws if, if we begin to have a problem with this. <laughs> um, moving forward, because I know that uh, lots of people in uh, who watch the show um, have followed the saga over the last, gosh, is it three years, four years now of Edward Snowden? Um, and we have uh, a president who could pardon him, who is going to be uh, departing the office soon. There are many who think that Edward Snowden should be pardoned. Uh, uh, president Obama has said he will, he ha will not. And one of the uh, bases he has cited for that uh, is that Snowden hasn't been charged with anything. Um, there's nothing to pardon him for, according to President Obama and and the folks who would really like to see him pardoned, Noah Yakot, if I'm saying that right, director of the Pardon Snowden campaign for one, uh, have been quick to point out that many other presidents in the past, including actually President Obama, have pardoned people who were indicted uh, but did not stand trial. Um, Richard Nixon hadn't been indicted when Gerald Ford pardoned him. Uh, and... Uh, the various thousands of people who invaded, who evaded the Vietnam War draft uh, were pardoned unconditionally as well um, by Jimmy Carter on his first day in office. So um, 
it doesn't seem like it's going to happen, folks, but it also seems like the, the justifications for it uh, may not may not actually I'm not, I'm not I'm not accusing the president of, of prevaricating here, but <laughs> perhaps uh, <laughs> if he wanted to pardon him, he could. What, what do you think, Mike? Oh, he, he clearly could pardon him. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. If he wanted to, whether there's an indictment or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't believe I could be wrong on this. You remember under the Clinton administration at the, the tail end, he pardoned Mark Rich. Uh, I, maybe he had been indicted, but I don't think he had been uh, or at least he hadn't been. I don't think he had ever been convicted. But yeah, the, I think the rationale. Indicted, what's that? I think he'd been indicted and then fled. I think that's what happened okay. there. All right. All right. Uh, but yeah, the rationale here doesn't seem to necessarily hold sway with what's happened with past presidencies in, oh yeah, and including including the current uh, administration. So, right. Uh, anything to add, Jessica? Yeah, just that, you know, if he does not think he should pardon Snowden for whatever reason, that's fine. But this sort of he's trying to basically dodge um, saying that mm -hmm. I do have a problem with if he thinks he's got grounds for not pardoning him. He's a president, but he should just be articulating those instead of trying to play cutesy here. Right. Uh, meanwhile, also in Washington, uh, Congress had a hearing this week on uh, augmented reality and I, I believe VR too, um, or maybe just, uh, well, yeah, the HoloLens and smart helmets, et cetera, um, asked a lot of um, questions about, uh, because these technologies are gonna make their way into um, things like perhaps airplanes. Uh, they have a lot of uh, safety related and privacy related questions about how the technologies are gonna work. Uh, there were questions about whether hackers could make a digital flock of birds appear in front of the windshield of an airplane and what can be done about things like that. Um, so it's good that the lawmakers are educating themselves about these issues and gathering uh, information from such knowledgeable folks as Ryan Kahlo, assistant professor of law at the University of Washington, who's joined us on the show before, uh, and others. Uh, Mike, do you feel good about the fact that uh, Congress is exploring the world of augmented reality? Uh, I do. In in theory, I do. I do like it for the exact reason you mentioned that yeah. you know our lawmakers are getting educated on this new technology and trying to get up to speed on exactly what it provides and and some of the benefits associated with it. Uh, so I do like that. But of course, I I always get a little. Uh, a little nervous about what that ultimately means in terms of additional regulations and and other laws that may be imposed as a result. But no, uh, as an initial step, I, I certainly think this is great. Right. They're concerned as well, not just with safety and privacy, but also with how it uh, impacts the job market. On the one hand, people um, can be trained in jobs in these techniques uh, quite effectively, but they're also um, concerned that use of these technologies could lead to de-skilling, making individual workers more replaceable and less valuable. They're concerned about an augmented reality digital divide. And at least one uh, Congress, now this is a, a Senate hearing that was held. So this is a Senator, um, uh, what is his name here? I'm looking at a Verge article, um, Blumenthal. I believe. Yes, Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat from uh, Connecticut, uh, had n no notion. He thinks that Pokemon Go, because people can be hurt uh, if it's being played uh, with any movement involved, uh, should have no movement involved in the play of the game. Um, so uh, they had an interesting and, and somewhat comical exchange about how a Pokemon Go may be unsafe at any speed. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've seen people walk into other people playing Pokemon Go, so he's got a point. Uh, any thoughts, Jessica? No, I mean, I agree with Mike. I don't know quite what they would intend to do with this knowledge or what if they're thinking of regulations. I think education is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the concern they raise that I 
do share and would hope that Congress maybe could do something about is the digital divide um, and, you know, what we can do as a nation to address that so you don't end up with people who don't have the access to or the knowledge of these technologies that are going to play a big role in our futures. Uh, one of the things I mentioned they are concerned about is is the privacy ramifications of augmented reality technologies. And, of course, the Snapchat spectacles are out and uh, being snapped up by anyone who can get them out of their robot dispenser. Uh, and it just, uh, my reaction to seeing the frenzy around these things is... How come everybody was so upset about Google Glass but these Snapchat spectacles just don't seem to be a problem at all? Um, of course, uh, tech blogger David Papp uh, pulled out the privacy issue and wrote about that. He, he says the possibility does exist. The people will use them in inappropriate ways. Embarrassing clips could go viral. If users wear them in public washrooms or capture stealth videos of careless remarks, there's a possibility of abuse. Um, and... Of course, there's the metadata involved as well uh, that is captured every time something is recorded, whether it's with glasses or a phone or what have you, including location, facial, voice recognition data, uh, where, you know, people are not necessarily consenting to have their data recorded in public in this way. And we get into the question of, you know, how much privacy do you have in public? But just from a pure adoption, excitement uh, level. Maybe it's just because they're sunglasses. <laughs> Maybe it's because you're not that likely to be wearing them inside. I don't know. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> yeah, good, good question. I don't know either. You know, as we've talked about before, I, I always feel like anytime I'm out in public, there's always going to be some sort of recording going on, whether I like it or not. So I, uh, you know, this doesn't really, this really doesn't disturb me all that, all that much. No, it doesn't disturb me, I think, either uh, because of all the devices that are already at people's disposals. Uh, you know, I mean, you cannot, the reason these things exist is you cannot keep people from taking selfies or otherwise, you know, recording their life experience. Um, so this is just another way to do so. Uh, but I, I just think the contrast between the reaction to these and Google Glass is pretty stark. And it hasn't been that long a time, at least it doesn't seem like that to me. You agree, Jessica? I actually don't. And um, maybe this is because I'm an old curmudgeon mm. and I'm not that big a tech <laughs> geek. Um, but I actually have been thinking for a while now and actually saw, you know, in a couple of the other Fourth Amendment issues we talked about is I feel like the law in the U.S. Um, and this whole reasonable expectation of privacy kind of idea that was applied pre you know, current technology um, really needs to be revamped. Uh, you know, the idea, yes, I understand if you're out in public, your right to privacy is somewhat reduced. If I see a camera crew down the road, however, I can avoid that camera crew if I don't want to be on camera. Um, if, you know, in theory, if I see people taking selfies, I could move out of the way. You know, the more and more discreet these kind of recording devices get, um, I don't think that, you know, by walking down the street, I've consented to anyone being able to videotape me and put me online. And I, you know, I'm not an expert on privacy, but I do know that I've, you know, heard several attorneys speak and talk about the U.S. approach to privacy is, well, you can't really regulate these things. And a lot of European nations are like, no, actually you can. Um, so I don't know that the courts could do it here, although I do feel like the courts need to start because this goes to metadata, too, and the idea of the information that we share really unwillingly with our telephone companies. Um, you know, they're like, well, if you have a phone or if you go on the Internet, you're consenting to all this. But really, it's kind of like a contract of adhesion at this point that, um, you know, to get along today uh, in most parts of the of our society, you do need access to these sort of things. And the idea that we have given up all rights to privacy by using them does actually bother me. And I don't think that it has to be that way. If we as a society choose for it to be that way, I guess I can't rail against that too much. But I actually am one of those who feels like um, we just all act like this is just something that, well, there's nothing we can do. So that's my rant for the day. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's it's a topical rant because it actually leads right into something else I wanted to talk about today, and that's a blog post uh, from Eric Goldman's technology and marketing law blog. Uh, this case is um, SE versus Chermkovsky. 
Uh, and I put it in as, um, well, I think it's a really interesting case and it goes right to what we're talking about. And also as sort of a public service announcement to all of our listeners and viewers, that if you are um, taking someone's photograph uh, and memeing it, putting a caption on it, and maybe it's kind of a derogatory caption or a funny caption uh, that is driving humor from the subject's expense, uh, that you can actually get in trouble for that uh, and they can sue you for it. And that's what successfully happened here in this case. There was a photo uh, of a young woman, her, she's identified in the lawsuit as SE and uh, she has Down syndrome. And she was uh, eating a uh, hot dog, I suspect, at a baseball game outside a concession stand. Uh, and someone, uh, I'm not sure who, um, she was photographed. It doesn't say who the photo photographer was. I think it was just someone, not someone she knew, just someone who was at the game and she's in public. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was posted and someone, um, uh, I guess it was the ph photographer uh, herself who memed the caption, uh, put, the, put a caption on the photo uh, that said, um, letting your child become obese should be considered child abuse. And then it, it kind of went viral. Um, much to the dismay of the subject of the photo, uh, who did sue. Um, there was a motion to dismiss, uh, but there was a um, false light invasion of privacy claim that survived. Uh, and I, you could see various other claims perhaps in this kind of situation. Uh, surviving as well, right of publicity kinds of claims, um, other um, sort of personal right kind of claims. Uh, but here it was false light invasion of privacy and she prevailed. You'll be happy to know, Jessica. Did you look at this? And <laughs> I did actually. And yes, I thought that was, I was uh, in support of that result. I do agree. I thought, um, I understand the message that was intended, but that was really just being cruel to someone. So I thought I that would have been false light. Yeah. So I mean, it's not it's it's not a great solution, as you say. You know, if there is enough public outcry about um, unauthorized photographs and video of people in public, then perhaps we need to change our laws about it because I think as you as you point out that the way it goes now, your expectation of privacy in a public place is low in the United States. Um, so uh, at least until then we have the ability to sue, but for many, many people, that's, that's not a great option, I'm sure. Um, nobody wanted to have to bring a lawsuit in this case. And by the time the lawsuit was brought, a, a lot of damage to this young woman had already been done. Um, Let's yeah. move on to uh, Mike. Uh, did, did you want to chime yeah, in on this? Yeah, lest my my prior comment be misinterpreted, <laughs> I actually fully support uh, this decision. Yeah, you know, I I think there is a meaningful distinction between appearing in public and and knowing that you have a reduced right of privacy because of all the technological developments uh, over the last several years. And there's that reality, but then there's also the whole notion of notwithstanding that, that doesn't mean that I give, simply by going out in public, I give anybody license to use my name, image, or likeness in any manner in which they choose. That's obviously a, a completely different issue. And I'm, I'm all for this ultimate result. I thought it was a, a, you know, terrible what uh, was done by the defendant here, Chim, Chim Rakowski, I think that's the, the fella. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's absolutely right. Right. Uh, let's move on to a journalism related story. Again, this is in the rundown, uh, just so that people know. Uh, I, I think that lots of people who listen to and watch the show uh, might be, as I said with the last story, tempted to um, make a meme and pass it around. You know, it's kind of a funny thing to do on the internet. Uh, and, and definitely folks who watch and listen to the show might be tempted if they are at um, a newsworthy event to... Uh, tweet or otherwise um, broadcast to the world what's going on there. And that's uh, what was at issue here. Uh, 
the World Chess Championship uh, was going on in New York. Uh, and there was a an assertion by the company putting on that championship uh, that uh, the moves of the players uh, were the property of the organizers and could not be tweeted out, you know, in real time as they were happening. Uh, there, there was actually a restraining order and a preliminary injunction that was sought and denied. And uh, the court decided that uh, Chess24 was the person in question who was basically doing journalism from uh, the chess match. Uh, not persuaded that Chess24 would be taking content from World Chess and merely free riding or republishing the information for Chess24's own subscribers. Uh, rather, the evidence presented indicates that Chess24 digests factual information about the championship from secondary sources and creates its own website content at great expense. So um, interesting uh, in its own right. And then over at uh, THR Esquire, uh, Eric Gardner has a really interesting post noting that decision and extrapolating it out to uh, the New York Times meeting with President-elect Trump and uh, how various folks were um, uh, live tweeting what was happening there in that session. Uh, and, uh, how, you know, nobody seems to have objected to that. Uh, but this could be a broader issue. Um, you could see, for, he says at the end, uh, for example, say it wasn't the New York times, um, say he was in a private session with Breitbart and Breitbart decided uh, that no one was allowed to re-report that commentary. Um, there could be an issue there or with any other um, outlet. It's something that comes up over and over again uh, in the context of sporting events, which I guess are sort of similar to chess matches, et cetera. Um, what is the property of the organizer and what is uh, the property of the spectators to report as they would wish. Uh, so Mike, do you agree with how this one came out? I do. Uh, it's really a it, very interesting case, interesting dispute, but I think ultimately it's right. Um, you know, we don't, uh, I think the analogy to a, a sporting event is, is apropos. Um, you know, sport moves, uh, athletes, um, you know, make great daring uh, feats and, and all sorts of athletic accomplishments on the field. But that's not really a work of authorship, as we understand the term in the copyright sense of the word. Um, and similar to a chess player who may make a brilliant move uh, in a chess match, that's really not a, a work of authorship. It, it's something that falls outside of that realm. So ultimately, I thought this was this was the right decision by the court. All right, Jessica, do you agree? I do. I mean, obviously, I thought this was the right decision. And I guess it does come down to if it had gone the other way, you do also start having this fuzzy line of what is considered news and do people get to control who has a right to broadcast news? Um, you know, not the images, obviously, with the sporting events or like the NFL um, being having a very tight grip on controlling the images. But the fact of who won the latest Packers game or if Aaron Rodgers had a great game or not, which is very big news here in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if only the NFL network were allowed to broadcast that sort of thing, I do think that could be a very dangerous, slippery slope that we could go down, um, especially with the analogy to the New York Times meeting with Donald Trump at one point would that not become news? Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that I didn't see addressed in any of this that I'm like, could resolve this, right? And I wouldn't be thrilled about it, but would be if they had forced, um, and obviously this only works with smaller groups, but if they had forced everybody to sign some sort of confidentiality agreement um, before they watched or participated in the chess match or met with Trump, um, that would be a way for the New York Times or the, the chess organizer to then control, I guess, the news. Right. And, and getting back to the sporting event analogy, uh, sometimes we've seen examples of uh, fine print on the back of your ticket 
restricting your rights to, um, you know, photograph or broadcast or what have you from the venue. Um, so uh, what, what you're proposing at least is a little bit more uh, palatable than that, uh, that someone would actually have the chance to review and, and uh, decide whether or not to accept those strictures before participating in the event. Uh, and it's something, you know, I agree with you that it's something that as more and more people um, are constantly, uh, whether they're using their Snapchat goggles, perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> to record what's going on, right. um, that, that stuff is just shared. Uh, it's just the ubiquitous uh, way, order of things in our society these days. So um, uh, I, I do think that we will see more attempts to rein that in, in the way you suggest, Jessica. And I, I don't know that, you know, I mean, in some circumstances, that'll be a good thing and some uh, it will be a curtailment of journalism and speech. Right. Um, all right. One, one point I want to on. make sure to, to clarify when I said that individual sport moves are not protected by copyright. Uh, uh, I meant the individual athletes that are performing these particular moves on the field. Those are not protected by copyright. Of course, there is copyright protection for the broadcast. Uh, the NFL and the other uh, you know, sport leagues own the copyright in the actual uh, game itself that is being simultaneously recorded. So just wanted to point that out. Yes. Uh, I promised a, a lot of great legal geeks posts <laughs> and analyses of fantasy legal situations. And, and we do have one more of those left for you again, involving Dr. Strange in just a moment here. Uh, but first we're going to thank our second sponsor for this episode of this week in law. And that is Braintree code for easy mobile payments. Maybe you're working on the next Uber, Airbnb, or GitHub. I certainly hope that you are. Then why not use the same simple payment solution that helped them become what they are today? Braintree makes mobile payments so fast, easy, and seamless, it's almost magical. Add it to your app with just a few lines of code, and you're instantly ready to accept Apple Pay, Android Pay, PayPal, Venmo, credit cards, even Bitcoin. And if some other way to pay comes along, Braintree is going to support that too. Braintree's fast payouts and continuous support mean you'll always be ready, whether you're earning your first dollar or your billionth. You'll see fewer abandoned carts and more sales with Braintree's best-in-class mobile checkout experience. Braintree gives you a full-stack payment solution, support for all payment types your customers might want, single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. To check it out for yourself, visit braintreepayments.com slash twill. Thank you so much, Braintree, for your support of This Week in Law. All right, uh, one more story, and I didn't have a real good uh, usual topic to put this under, so I get to use one of my favorite bumpers that we rarely use, other. <laughs> it's just so much drama for such a... <laughs> mild mannered word other uh all right not very mild mannered himself is dr strange in fact again we should we didn't do any spoiler alerts before the last time we discussed dr strange sorry about that but i'm doing it now if you haven't seen the movie walk out of the room if you intend to see the movie and you haven't seen it yet walk out of the room and skip this story uh but uh if you have then you know that dr strange is is not uh afraid to uh muscle his way into forbidden parts of the library and read books that uh can involve spells that are are quite uh, powerful and perhaps dangerous however uh, the warnings for all of those spells we learn uh, come after the text of the spells. It t tends to get him in trouble in the film. And, of course, the legal geeks point out that that's not really the effective way to give a warning. Can you tell us more about that, Jessica? No, first, I have to say I love this post that uh, Josh did. I actually feel that way about recipes sometimes where there are details after you follow through some of the directions that I'm like, okay, that detail should have been put up front because otherwise you find yourself in trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, and this is one of those things that, you know, I love my comic books, but sometimes they do do things like this to create problems that were really kind of silly. And the idea, obviously, of having these very dangerous spells and then after you read through it, 
presumably saying this spell. Then they're like, oh, by the way, watch out for X, Y, and Z. Um, that obviously is a great plot device. Uh, in real life, it would not... Hopefully anybody who is selling spells would not do it that way. And in fact, if we were to apply like, you know, kind of state laws on um, drugs or other dangerous materials, usually there they require that the um, that you have adequate warnings and that there's, you know, good notice of them. So that way you are aware of um, what you're doing before you actually take the action that could cause the uh, the danger. So, um, yes. Yeah, so obviously if this were in California, for example, um, it would be required that the warning should be in a manner and form as necessary for the protection of the users, which would mean that, you know what, those risks should go up right up front and say, stop, before you read anything, know that this could happen. So um, this is why a lot of those government regulations can keep people out of trouble. I don't know. I kind of think that if you're going to chain up a book in a... <laughs> library with various mystical guardians that perhaps the warning is implied. Although jo Josh does um, point out too that the sling rings uh, of Dr. Strange's world uh, are hazardous devices in their own right that, that requ should require a warning of some kind because when you're crossing into another realm, you don't know what you're going to encounter there. Perhaps bacteriological dangers. There could be anything on the other side of that portal. <laughs> <laughs> As we saw, the tornado you know, could be over there. Yes, the top of Mount oh. Everest and the possibility of freezing to death. Um, so it's it's uh, quite a quite a delightful post and raises a good point for all of us to bear in mind. Uh, with that, we will uh, move on to our concluding materials, uh, beginning with our animal selfie of the week. <laughs> Our animal selfie of the week comes to us this week from listener Jonathan Annett. Uh, it is a, oh, sorry, I have to adjust something here. Not used to recording in the studio and I have popped out. There we go. Now I can hear everyone again. Uh, and I can see Danny Sullivan's guinea pig. Uh, Danny Sullivan, friend of the Twit Network, uh, often guest Aww. on This Week in Tech. This is his guinea pig's selfie that he posted. And uh, I will um, just point out that uh, when I saw this, I was reminded of a book that um, my uh, grandmother used used to like to read to me um, and I'll toss it out to you in case you haven't heard of it. It is called Pigs as Pigs and it was first published as a short story in American Illustrated Magazine in September 1905 uh, and then it went into print and I think that's how it came into my grandmother's hands. It's this hysterical story where um, guinea pigs wind up sort of held hostage at a... Uh, train depot uh, where the um, uh, official there is unsure uh, whether the freight charge uh, should be a livestock freight charge or a lower charge for domestic pets. And meanwhile, while they're trying to iron out this financial uh, snafu, the guinea pigs do what guinea pigs do and they multiply and again and again and again. And what I found out when I looked this up uh, to mention it on the show today is uh, that Robert Heinlein uh, and his flat cats, uh, he credits this story as the information for the flat cats appearing in his novel, The Rolling Stones. And then uh, we learn later that David Gerald's uh, Tribbles uh, in Star Trek uh, were probably inspired by the flat cats. So I think it all goes back to a guinea pig is what I'm saying. That Tribbles, wow, that guinea is pigs. Cool. Isn't that cool? So, Robert Heinlein. I'm a huge Robert Heinlein fan. That yes. is amazing. So there we go. Uh, the... Um, let me see what the Wikipedia reference is that. Uh, the the birth, sale, and final production of one episode being, uh, that episode being The Trouble with Tribbles, a book by uh, David Gerald. Um, so uh, there we go. Thank you, Danny Sullivan's guinea pig for uh, providing our animal selfie of the week and possibly the origin of Tribbles. 
We're going to go ahead and put our second passphrase into the show for any of you listening for MCLE credit. And that is, where do tribbles come from? And uh, we don't actually have a tip of the week this week, but I think I will make our tip of the week what we mentioned to you before uh, about being wary of um, memeing photos. I think you need to be wary not just uh, of the uh, possibility of being sued for invasion of privacy, false light, but of course there's the copyright ramification of creating a meme out of a photo as well. You don't know uh, whose photo you're using. Uh, this is the Donald Trump Jr. Uh, issue uh, with the bowl of Skittles. Um, so if you're going to create or use or even circulate a meme, you should be aware that there, there are many uh, legal avenues that someone might uh, take umbrage and come after you. Uh, so as sad as that may be, it is, it is the truth. Uh, we, I, we do have a couple of resources of the week for you. One is extremely cerebral and the other one is not. Um, we'll start with the cerebral one first. Uh, it is an article in the Yale Law Journal that deals with the Fourth Amendment in the information age, which is something we've discussed much on the show today. It's by Rob Professor Robert S. Litt. And uh, I recommend that uh, people interested in these issues read the whole thing. It is rather long and dense, but I'll cut to the chase for you and, and say that Professor Litt propo proposes that in um, assessing Fourth Amendment issues, maybe courts should start bypassing this whole analysis that they tend to get bogged down in of whether the person has an expectation of privacy uh, concerning the particular search in question and cut straight to the issue of whether the search was reasonable in the circumstances. Um, he thinks it just makes more sense uh, when we're dealing with digitally stored information and and makes the analysis easier. So um, I encourage folks to check that out. And I also encourage folks, now this is the more lighthearted research or resource, <laughs> uh, to please check out the Legal Geeks Awesome Mixtape Volume 2. And I am assuming there is a Legal Geeks Awesome Mixtape Volume 1 somewhere. Uh, volume <laughs> 2 features, uh, and it looks like a Spotify playlist of tunes released in 1988 or years earlier. Uh, uh, that is just some great listening. You want to tell us more about this, Jessica? These were inspired by the Guardians of the Galaxy, his mixtape that he had made. That's why they had to be pre-1988. Um, and I think volume one is Josh's mixtape. And volume two is my mixtape. So you can see my kind of very odd, really not very good musical taste. But these are some of my favorites. Um from that era that I had to put on. Excellent. We're, we're happy to have it. And I'm sure our viewers and listeners are too. I always love a good music mix. So thank you for creating, Me too. creating that for us. And this has been such a fun show. Thank you for creating the show for us. I'm really glad that you were able to join us. It's been great meeting you, Jessica. Is there anything going on with your practice or your blog or anything else that you want to mention before we go ahead and wrap the show? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say thanks to both of you. This was a lot of fun, and um, I learned a lot about the law outside of my kind of normal business litigation and IP litigation that I do. So I appreciate the opportunity a lot. Um, as for us, I'm just getting ramped up for a big trial, so I'm kind of disappearing between now and the end of March. But on the Legal Geeks, we are um, kind of counting down to the Rogue One release. So mm -hmm. I just posted mm -hmm. a little ode to Darth Vader, one of my favorite characters from the Star Wars universe. Yes, that's me and Darth at Comic-Con. <laughs> Yay, look at that. So, but we'll be doing a lot of Star Wars posts between now and December 16th. And I'm going to take some time out from trial prep to go see Rogue One once or twice. So looking forward to that. Good. Well, I'm not going to be seeing Great. it in your neck of the woods, but I'm certainly going to be seeing it. I think I mentioned already that The Legal Geeks also has a podcast, but if I didn't mention it already, it does. And if folks would like to hear more from Jessica and Josh uh, about the issues that they discuss on their uh, on their blog, uh, their podcast is great. I listened to uh, at least part of one episode, Sweet Christmas, Let's Discuss Luke Cage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guys do a really good job. So I want to plug Thanks. that too. Uh, Mike, uh, I know you're uh, running around and, and getting year end stuff done. Anything you want to let us know about other than, uh, and, and by the way, can you deliver it in verse? 
That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I might need a couple of minutes to come up with something. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I want to remind everybody that next week we will be having Joe Bennett. He is a musicologist from the Berkeley College of Music. He's going to be discussing the Led Zeppelin case and some of the recent uh, music copyright cases that have been filed. So definitely we'll want to tune in. He's a great guy, very knowledgeable. It should be a great show. Oh, perfect. And I just want to thank, uh, want to thank Jessica for being here with us today. Uh, terrific to be with you. Love, love the Legal Geeks. It's a great, uh, great blog and certainly <laughs> worthy of all the praise that it's getting. So great job. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And good luck in your trial. Thank you. Absolutely. Between now and March, that is a really big trial. <laughs> good it, luck it's indeed. a massive one. Yeah. Right. Well, I hope it goes well for you. Uh, and I hope that all of you can join us when we record these shows every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1900 UTC this time of year. Uh, we love having you join us live, but don't worry if you can't. Our uh, All our archive of shows is up at twit.tv slash twill. Uh, you can find all our episodes there. You can find ways to enjoy the show, whether you prefer to watch on a small phone or a vast uh, room-sized television. There are ways that you can do all of that uh, on your own time and schedule. So um, go ahead and check that out for yourself. Uh, you can certainly subscribe to the show in iTunes uh, you can watch it on Roku, however you prefer to enjoy the show. We're just happy that you enjoy the show, that you come and join us. Uh, seriously, we love uh, the feedback that we get from you, the suggestions that we get from you for guests, for tips, for resources, all that stuff. Please uh, continue to get to flood them our way. Email us. Mike is Mike at twit.tv. I'm Denise at twit.tv. Emery, who is busy with some travel and school stuff, probably for the rest of the year, is Emery at twit.tv. If you want to get in touch with him, we'll see him again after the first. Um, what else should I let you know? Uh, I should let you know that uh, we also have a couple of social media ways you can get in touch with us. You can tweet at us. That's a great way to go. Um, uh, we definitely check those frequently and um, uh, get a lot of great information from folks tweeting us stuff. Uh, also, there's a Facebook page for the show, a Google Plus page for the show. However you get in touch with us, uh, please just do keep those suggestions coming. We love it. Uh, and uh, in fact, the um, chess match uh, story that we discussed this week, I was getting fed uh, in real time as it was happening from one of our listeners. So that was great to know that it was an unfolding. I wasn't getting tweets of the um, actual chess moves, <laughs> but just that, just that this was an issue. Um, so uh, wonderful that you've been able to join us. Uh, please do so again. We're really looking forward to next week's show. We'll go ahead and uh, be sure and include the Duran Duran news that we were just talking about uh, pre-show today uh, and a lot of other musical uh, musically interesting legal issues as well for next week. And we hope to see you then on This Week in Law. Take care. <laughs>